Nate Wilcox has many opinions, and he is not afraid to use them all. Nate joins the Plutopia podcast this time as we discuss politics, politicians, and other dangerous predators. If you look into into the details of how he got into this situation, it's it's Shakespearean. I mean, basically, the guy wanted to show the producers at NBC that, hey, assholes, you should be paying me more money to star on whatever reality show it was, because look at how good my polling numbers are going to be. And he never thought he would win. He didn't even really intend to get the nomination. And, he, and, and there are accurate accounts of election night 2016 where he's just as shocked and horrified as anybody else that he's getting elected. And now he's in this position where if he doesn't run for office, he goes to prison. You know, it's it's so his his interests are pretty easy to see through. I mean, the, the guy wants to eat cheeseburgers, talk about himself and and not go to prison and get money out of people. We are back with yet another episode of the Plutopia News Network. I'm here with my uh, partner, Scoop Sweeney. I'm John Lepkowski. And our guest today is Nate Wilcox. Nate, who used to be a political consultant, and then he became a mixed martial arts blogger, uh, <laughs> cage fighting being a lot like politics, and then, uh, in fact, maybe the same as politics, <laughs> and then also the host of the Let It Roll podcast. Is that still happening? That's still happening. Uh, it's it? on hiatus right now. Um, I'm I'm moving the uh, archives onto uh, a Substack and swapping out for 35 minute previews for free. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah, just need to recharge my batteries. I read so many bad music books that I just <laughs> uh, burnt out, and I, I'm still doing it to myself. I just I just read a biography of REM, and there's literally no narrative interest in their entire 30 year <laughs> career. It's amazing, amazing career, and you know, some people love their music. I like some of their music, don't like others of their music, but. I mean, talk about a plotless book. But anyway, that's neither here. <laughs> Not everybody can be. Well, I um, whatever. I haven't read a music book in a while. I think the last one I read was Astral Weeks, which was, it was kind of about, and you should read this if you haven't already. I'm, I'm, it was I'm kind of about it. Van Morrison. Yeah, it was really all about the Boston music scene. And it's pretty fascinating. Uh, but we are here to talk about God knows what. I mean, we we were going to talk about some technology stuff, but then there have been some interesting political stories lately, going back to the debate between uh, Donald Trump and uh, Joe Biden. Or the ghost of Joe Biden. And uh, today we're hearing, huh? Or the ghost of Joe What's Biden. What's <laughs> The, the ghost, ghost of, of Joe, Joe Biden. Biden. What was left of Joe Biden? Well, there, there does seem to be an interest. Uh, well, it's kind of a mixed thing. There's a lot of people who are mounting like powerful defenses of Joe Biden, but there are other people who are calling for him to step down. So what do you think, Nate? I mean, I don't think that either of those are going to solve the problem. Um, we're in the midst of a extended cultural, economic, military collapse. Um, we haven't, it's been in crisis mode since at least 2000 when the Supreme Court stole the election for G.W. Bush. Um, the Democrats are, I, I don't know, it's been fascinating in so many ways to develop. I, I, I wrote off Biden in 2020 because he was so visibly senile. And on top of it, this is the guy, you know, Biden was the first candidate I ever publicly endorsed as the editor of my senior, of my high school newspaper in 1988. And I'd read two Time Magazine articles about the field and I was, you know, knowledgeable and, and prepared to pontificate. And, uh, and nobody read this, you know, the high school newspaper presidential endorsements anyway. And so I endorsed Joe Biden because of his record as a senator, blah, blah, blah. And within weeks, he's mired in this plagiarism scandal and falling out of the race. You know, so like I pegged him early on as not a good politician and not, you know, not somebody who was ever going to be president. And then 
he crawled into the 2008 primary and and was seemingly selected for VP after he disgraced himself again by making flagrantly racist remarks about Obama um, being very clean and articulate or whatever it was he said. And seemed to have been chosen because Obama strongly did not want Hillary Clinton as his VP. John Edwards had had his own scandal and was out. And Biden seemed harmless. Plus, you know, maybe old white people that are skeptical of Obama would like him better if Biden, you know, they got the sign off from Pennsylvania Joe or whatever. Scranton Joe. Um, and so in 2020, when he comes back and he's senile and still the same idiot shitbag he's always been, I and and then lost, you know, did so badly in Iowa and New Hampshire, I did not see the big maneuvers coming from Obama when Obama almost overnight got all of the Democratic field to drop out of the race, except for Elizabeth Warren, whose arm was twisted to stay in, you know, and um, you know, they moved mountains to, to stop Sanders from getting the nomination and put Biden in place. And so it's been, you know, it's just one of these situations where, you know, the Rowdy Roddy Piper movie where um, he sees that the world they is live. By, evil, by evil aliens. They live. That's yeah. sort of my constant political experience. I mean, having had a little bit of inside exposure to just how corrupt and idiotic the people who run our country are. I'm constantly feeling like, you know, hey, hey, guys, this is this is bad. Y'all, uh, do y'all see, does anybody see this? Does anybody see this? And so, you know, when Biden's debate performance was so bad that a number of like actual Democratic elected officials I know are, are have told me I can't vote for Biden now, um, you know, and I was kind of like, well, where have you been? You know, <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, that, none of that's really my point. I don't think I have anything especially interesting to say about Biden. It's sort of interesting to watch like Lloyd Doggett from Austin uh, calling for him to, to step aside, although not to step down. And the thing that I think gets to the lack of reality in our political discourse is almost all the discussion about Biden has ba been based on how does this impact his chances to win the election? And some discussion of, is he going to be able to serve as president in the next four years? But it's a tell that nobody cares. Uh, you know, we're in, involved in two major regional wars right now and talking about a third and maybe a fourth. Shouldn't it be important that the president not be demented and be functional? And that hasn't even been mentioned, you know, so it's just kind of like, whoa, you know, like the um, uh, it's it's anyway, just kind of staggering. But I think the thing that I saw a tweet today that that I thought sort of summed up our moment um, relatively well, or at least uh, helped me understand a little bit. And it was a comparison with um, it was it was a four or five t part Twitter thread by somebody called The Black Horse about George R. R. Martin and his inability to complete the Game of Thrones. And basically the guy's premise was, or the tweeter's premise was, that Martin sets up this scenario in the series that the old order that was imposed by some grandfather king a few generations ago is collapsing and that the people fighting for power do these things to advance their own personal interests that result in the dramatic diminishment of the regime they're part of. And the system is creaking and on the verge of collapse. And at the end of every book, Martin sort of blinks and can't bring himself to resolve the scenario. So he does all these plot twists and sets us up for another book of more of the same. And ultimately then couldn't complete the series in time for HBO and HBO, you know, makes a very bad imitation version for the last couple of seasons, but that fundamentally, Martin couldn't bring himself um, to believe in any of the possibilities. And let, let me quote the dude. Um, and so we have the perfect encapsulation of our moment. The status quo remains because no force is able to displace, dis, no force is able to displace it that the current American elite is able to bring itself to believe in. The story has only one ending, the crowning of a new king. And I don't think he means that literally in terms of America, just in terms, he does mean it literally in terms of Game of Thrones, but just meaning a new regime. And I don't mean Democratic or Republican. I mean a, a philosophical regime. We've been in the yeah. same regime since Reagan, you know, and and there was 
Obama was kind of the logical time historically when we would have switched to a new regime. But for whatever reason, and I think it was largely beyond his control, Obama was not a, was not a transformative president. He was sort of a simulation of a transformative president. And he continued Reagan's, you know, the, the, the neoliberal project of, of increased, uh, you know, inequality and more money to the powerful and more... Um, you know, I mean, the biggest bank fraud in human history was committed and, and nobody went to jail, you know, and many of them stayed in charge of their banks. And, um, yeah, you know, they kind of just stapled things together. Um, but but fundamentally, uh, you know, we're, we're this lack of. Of. I imagination and vision and, and the 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 key line that ends with is. Um, the story has only one ending, the crowning of a new king, but the war of belief to bring us to that ending has not even begun. And this is something that uh, there's a guy named Jack Whelan, who's just a blogger and, and a student of philosophy that I followed for a long time. And I don't agree with him about everything or whatever. He's a Catholic philosopher, but he's a student of philosophy who writes about our current political situation. And he's helped me answer a lot of things I didn't understand. Like for a long time, I never understood why did the Puritan revolution in England not stick in the 1600s? You know, Cromwell and the Puritans mopped the floor with the king and the cavaliers militarily and economically. There was no danger to the country. It was not falling apart. Um, but as soon as Cromwell died, they bring back Charles the son, even though nobody thought that would solve any of the problems that it caused his father to be overthrown in the first place, right? And they continued to have the same sort of sectarian tensions between Catholic kings and, and, a, and a Protestant English population for another until 1788 or whatever, the Glorious Revolution of William of Orange. But I didn't understand. I was like, why, why was it that Cromwell's revolution didn't hold? And through Jack Wagelin and others, it was because the philosophical work had not been done. Cromwell was going off Martin Luther, basically, and this faith had taken hold in people's minds, but a faith is not an articulated political philosophy. And so you needed things like John Locke and David Hume and Adam Smith and all these other thinkers to argue and articulate how should people be organized? What is the source of human power? You know, why, why, who should rule us and, you know, what are rights and things like that? And so you had to have a whole hundred years of discussion, philosophical debate before we could have the American and French revolutions that implemented some of those ideas and proved to be uh, able to create this new liberal order of, you know, elected governments and corporations and so on and so forth. That's, that's run us in a big picture. <laughs> and so, you know, what's happened now is the political debate in the last few years has been sort of this, the, 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 the conservative, you know, we had a two party system for forever and ever. The, the Republicans right, as right. the conservatives and the Democrats as the, as the liberals, although both in the, in the context of a liberal order. And with GW Bush, that old order of Republicans basically lost all its credibility and collapsed. And you saw that when Trump just walks into the Republican Party in 2016 and takes it over with this sort of dime store fascism kind of thing. But it's not, I mean, we've seen some scary things with Proud Boys and, you know, police riots and different things that that, that smack of fascism and, and um, certainly are liberal governments and fascism have always had kind of uh other than than Hitler or whatever, they, they generally can kind of work together, especially on the periphery of the empire. The American government was fine with fascists in Chile. We were fine with fascists in Argentina mm -hmm. until they screwed up and invaded the Falkland Islands. And, and you know, we couldn't referee between them and our boys in England. Um, but, you know, so we've we had this kind of tin pot fascism replacing the Republicans, the old Republican status quo. But the Democrats rejected Bernie Sanders and and what was trying to be done there and and which was a socialist a sort of I wouldn't even call it really a socialist movement but more like an FDR style democratic socialism you know movement and and it's funny to watch British politics because what happened to Jeremy Corbyn was so similar to to Bernie Sanders I mean this movement starts centered around an older leader who has these kind of left wing not fully left wing, but you know, as left wing as it's been allowed to get the neoliberal, uh, yeah, bona fides, 
but then he's relentlessly crushed. And Corbyn's betrayal by his own party is much better documented than Sanders' betrayal by his own par party. Um, you know, they trumped up this anti-Semitism stuff um, about Corbyn and, 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 you know, created this fake crisis of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. And the British media is much more conservative than our media. Uh, um, and so really, really, uh, you know, destroyed him. And now the, the Tories have completely destroyed themselves and might be on the point verge of not being one of the top two parties anymore. They're a little bit behind the Republican Party in that, you know, if you buy my thesis that the G.W. Bush was kind of the end of the line for the old style, um, you know, Reagan Republicans uh, or whatever, this the, the socially acceptable Republicans. I mean, there's something about Trump that has set off right so many figures in the media mm -hmm. and you know the deep state has become you know like everything else has been wildly misused as a term but there are people who are in the government administration after administration after administration and many of them are in three-letter agencies like the nsa and the fbi and the atf and the cia et cetera, et cetera. and things like you know the 51 intelligence retired intelligence officials or whatever who signed a thing saying that the hunter biden laptop story was obvious Rus russian disinformation i mean that was pretty interesting wow these people really hate trump you know like they really put themselves behind um yeah. the democrats in a big way which was a big change i mean historically those people and the democrats have been oil and water throughout the the mccarthy era through the nixon era et cetera. Et cetera. i mean probably some of them were involved Possibly, uh, definitely, they were involved in the deaths of, of multiple black Black Panther figures, like Fred Hampton. Possibly an MLK. Highly likely involved in the death of Malcolm X, and possibly involved in the deaths of the Kennedys. You know, so it's very odd to see that suddenly the Democrats and the CIA are just you know the tightest alliance uh, going. Um, but you know, but but at the same time, it seems like the business leaders which were very opposed to Trump in 2016, just you can look at their donations. They reconciled with Trump in the middle of his first term. I remember talking to a, a relative of mine who does high level security work for um, West Coast tech oligarchs. And, and he's kind of a, you know, as you might expect, he's not the philosopher king of of the tech world, but he is hearing what these guys are saying and will repeat it. You know, and 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 it became clear that that his bosses were basically fine with Trump after seeing his tax policies, et cetera, by you know twenty twenty or whatever. And you're seeing it now with a ton. Mm -hmm. Peter Thiel is no longer alone at being a tech executive that's endorsing. You're seeing David Sachs and a lot of other uh, people. Um, who have like Peter Thiel? I thought Thiel been, was trying to stay out of. I thought he was trying to stay out of politics. Thiel has backed now. off now, but in 2016, Thiel was his yeah. outlier that supported Trump. And Thiel's yeah, extremely yeah. weird and scary, you know. And, and you learn about his hmm. kind of fringe philosophical neo feudalism kind of political beliefs, and it's just like woo. But David Sachs is somebody who's obviously a capitalist oligarch, et cetera, et cetera. But he's much more able to articulate sort of a more appealing sort of semi-populist uh, position and also a pretty accurate, I think, critique of our foreign policy system. Um, you know, so you're seeing these forces kind of aligning and and the Republican Party has obviously given up any uh, interest in opposing Trump. I mean, the never Trumpers never had any constituency. That was one of the reasons it was so stupid for Chuck Schumer and Hillary Clinton and others to write off the working class and say, oh, for every hard work and blue collar guy we lose in the Midwest. We're going to get two of them in the wealthy suburbs of Philadelphia. And no, you're not. And you didn't. And you lost, you know, and, um, but, but Trump, Trump is now, a huge mess, man. I mean, do, oh, do they really a disaster. want to, I mean, Trump do they want to disaster, go there again? I mean, it, it, it's, it, it, do they I'm think he's saying, just so weak that they can control him? Well, is that's that a big factor. Cause, cause, cause I mean, on the one hand, he's this roll of the dice every time, but, on the other hand, yeah. he's a guy who'll go, you know, see John Bolton on Fox News two nights in a row and hire the guy to be, I can't remember what Bolton's position was. It Secretary of State? It was some nightmarish position to put one of the most evil like that. neocons in, you know, and, 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 Na and natural Trump security himself, advi national security advisor. Yeah, advisor, you know, but you had at one point where Trump, in his own dumbass way, was trying to negotiate a peace deal with North Korea. 
And Mike Pompeo, who might have been the Secretary of State, former head of the CIA, and John Bolton are actively sabotaging this, you know, or or Trump's trying to pull troops out of Afghanistan, but he didn't have control over the administrative levers enough to do it. He tried to pull troops out of Syria and and couldn't or wouldn't do it. But at the same time, he gets talked into something that's just harebrained and crazy, like a missile assassination of Iran's number one general, Soleimani, you know, like, so he's this extreme wild card. Like, he can go in any direction based on who he talked to last. You know, he's a guy with very little work ethic, almost no understanding of history or geopolitics, and certainly no understanding of a detailed way of how a presidential apparatus should work. And, you know, it's... Well, and he only seems to care about, you know, it's kind of like self-aggrandizing. He, only cares, he about cares about himself. being in the position of power. If yeah, you look himself. Into, into the details of how he got into this situation, it's, it's Shakespearean. I mean, basically, the guy wanted to show the producers at NBC that, hey, assholes, you should be paying me more money to star on whatever reality show it was, because look at how good my polling numbers are going to be. And he never thought he would win. He didn't even really intend to get the nomination. And, he, and, and there are accurate accounts of election night 2016, where he's just as shocked and horrified as anybody else that he's getting elected. And now he's in this position where if he doesn't run for office, he goes to prison. You know, it, it's, it's, so his, his interests are, pretty easy to see through. I mean, the, the guy wants to eat cheeseburgers, talk about himself and and not go to prison and get money out of people, you know. Um, right, but right. It's, you it's, know, you, you mentioned uh, the Bush uh, killing the, uh, the old Republican Party. Isn't that a bit reminiscent of what happened with LBJ? Because when he signed the uh, Civil Rights Act, that pretty much killed the old Democratic Party all the uh, That's uh, a deep LBJ. Southern Democrats dem yeah. became Republicans. And, 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 and LBJ was quoted as saying, I've just signed over the South to the Republicans for the next 25 years. However, if you look into the data, it wasn't until after Clinton that the South really, that the Democrats lost the South. I mean, remember Jimmy Carter? I mean, remember Bill Clinton? Mm -hmm. the, um, it was the neoliberal policies and carter frankly started the neoliberal policies hell john f kennedy really is the beginning of the pullback of the new deal and the and the neoliberal policies he's he's the first guy to start lowering tax rates etc cetera, etc cetera. um but it was it was clinton's just complete contempt for working americans and also american industry and i also think he had no for as smart as he is he had no uh Strate geostrategic understanding that if you export all your industry industrial capital you will no longer be an industrial war machine powerhouse money-making powerhouse you know I, mean, I think he believed so much of that francis fukuyama bullshit about the end of history and all that thomas friedman warren buffett crap about no two countries who have a mcdonald's have ever been to war you know which is no longer true um and, and, you know, this belief that, oh, if we just export all our industry to, to China and let them into the WTO, et cetera, they'll inevitably fall and become capitalists just like us. And then, you know, and they had this vision of the Davos crowd, kind of, you know, this international globalist elite, which I know is a right wing lizard people talking point, but it's also true. <laughs> there is this globalist elite that is transnational. And their problem is that they underestimated the geostrategic players at the table. And Xi in China, for example, has been much more formidable than I think anybody uh, in the U.S. expected. And um, ditto for Putin, ditto for the Iranian mullahs. I mean, all the, all the forces arrayed against us, which we've pretty much started every one of these fights. I mean, if you look at where and I'm not a Republican or whatever, but Nixon and Poppy Bush had us set up such that we were closer to China than Russia was, and we were closer to Russia than China was. You know, if you're the dominant power, you should always be thinking, we're not always going to be the dominant power. I mean, it's like once you climb to the top of the mountain, there's only one way to go down. And, and what you want to do is try to have a measured descent, you know, and you had various figures in history like Cardinal Richelieu or whatever, or um, uh, uh, Metinar. There was some 
figure behind the scenes in the Austrian Empire that 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 managed to keep the Austrian Empire together and a force for like a century and a half longer than they had any business being because he understood, hey, we're a rotten, collapsing, declining power. What we want to do is not start any wars, be allied with everybody whenever we can, get in the middle of things, be have better relationships with both sides of conflicts and stuff like that and kind of finesse it and be the smooth player at the table, you know? We went the exact opposite way and just brashly first um, kind of blundered into alienating Russia. I mean, Russia was supine. We could have done a Marshall Plan for Russia. And instead, we send Larry Summers, et cetera, over there. And Jeffrey Sachs, who's now kind of redeemed himself, but at the time in the 90s was in the thick of looting Russia. I mean, you know, it's on the record. We helped put, uh, Yeltsin fire cannons at their parliament. I mean, you know, like we did all these things that made it such that now we are enemies with Russia, which is totally self-defeating for us and not necessary. And we're in this geostrategic conflict with China after we exported our industrial capacity to China. There is literally no physical way you can go to war with and beat the country that has all of the industrial capacity you rely on. I mean, you know, and, and the thing that, that like that I've sort of put together, and I mean, I could be wrong or whatever, but the way I'm seeing things is I finally sort of acknowledged, okay, the same idiots that have run our companies into the ground, things like Boeing. I mean, it's, it's now an, an accepted yeah. fact that Boeing cannot make planes, right? And yet we still act as if we're the number right. one superpower in the history of the world. Well, yeah, guys, Boeing is one of four companies that makes our warplanes, okay? Like, they, the shit don't work. And it's super expensive and super exorbitant. What we have, we thought we had this evil military industrial complex that made us super powerful. But what we actually had was a military industrial money go round that's sort of like a boutique industry. They don't, they don't think about things like we're churning out a gazillion 155 millimeter shells because we've done the calculations and we know if we get in a war with, you know, all three powers we're talking about being in a war with, we're going to need X of this kind of shell and we're going to need Y of that kind of fuel and we're going to need this or that. They're not doing any logistics at all. They're the same scumbags that run every other corporation are manipulating spreadsheets so they get the biggest bonus this quarter because they've manipulated the numbers. And all you have to do is bribe congressmen for a few thousand dollars They'll sign off bills that give you hundreds of billions of dollars, you know, and so something like the war in Ukraine, which I, I hope everybody can see at this point is manifestly a disaster. It, I mean, you know, the, the I mean, you know, Obama told us in 2014, I'm not going to arm Ukraine because we're never going to have escalatory dominance with Russia in their neighborhood. You're just not no matter how corrupt and incompetent, you know, Putin may be. And he's plenty of both you're just not going to win a war against Russia and Ukraine period, unless they're absolutely like Yeltsin could have lost a war in Ukraine. You know, Tsar Nicholas II could have lost a war in Ukraine, but Russia has this nasty habit of doing things like Hitler and all the Nazis thought, Oh, we'll whip Russia's ass. No problem. We fought. I fought them in 1914. We, we mopped the floor with them. Well, yeah, that was Tsar Nicholas's Russia. When you got into into Uncle Joe Stalin's Russia, that was a whole different ball game, and the and the Germans learned to their regret very quickly. Holy shit, there's a lot more Russians than we thought. Oh my God, they've got a lot more tanks than we thought they had. Oh my God, we have to destroy another Russian army. Like and and you know it's it's just like <laughs> a bad bet. And and then to 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 have the effrontery to think we're gonna tangle with china in taiwan i mean this is well off of you know what what you'll ask me about but you know we're just in this situation where the people that are running and there's this this undercurrent i don't know if you followed it but you know my, my profession is essentially following the news that's what i was trained to do in politics and you know read a bunch of news sources filter it down so that the guy who has five minutes to read about your topic is reasonably well informed on the subject so i'm kind of an expert of uh, right. Okay, what are the sources in the story? Uh, you know, what other outlets are running the same story? Did, did, did you know? And, and you'd find, that especially like in the Ukraine war, that you'd have a lot of stories that quoted a lot of people inside the State Department, 
And then you just have a tiny number of friend stories, like a, a Newsweek story that nobody paid attention to, where somebody's quoting somebody in the Pentagon. And these Pentagon sources are telling a completely different story than these guys in the State Department. You know, you've got Blinken saying, oh, we're going to send this missile or that missile and just mop the floor. Oh, the war's going great, blah, blah, blah. And then you read this little quiet story over here, and somebody in the Pentagon's going, um actually we're the ones that are running out of shells here or uh that weapon system isn't actually going to be a game changer because of this that or the other you know like there's this big split and you're seeing this in israel too where the israeli generals know that hezbollah will wreck their shit, but netanyahu has a vested interest in staying in power and then he's got some of these lunatics around him who have this biblical visionary view of the world and facts are not in their agenda, and they're talking madness about invading Lebanon when Israel's top military college put out a report a couple years ago that said, if we get into a shooting war with Hezbollah, just Hezbollah, not Iran, just Hezbollah, they could shut down civilized life in Israel in 72 hours. They're talking airports, water cleaning facilities, you know, even if they don't do yeah. a reign of terror over civilian Tel Aviv. like. The last thing Israel wants to do is get in this war, a shooting war with Hezbollah or a full on. They're already in a shooting war. And, you know, it's just the same kind of shit. Like, like when the, <laughs> I mean, have y'all grappled with the fact that the fucking Houthis have cut off the Red Sea to. Global yeah, shooting? it's pretty weird. Uh, it's it's weird until you start following some people in the Navy and the Merchant Marine and start looking into how many ships do we have? How, how much do we invest in the Navy versus the Army? What kind of ships actually work in this, this era? How do ships do against drones and missiles and everything? And, and what does it take to disable an aircraft carrier? You don't have to sink an aircraft carrier to disable it. You basically just have to scuff the fucking deck. I mean, our jets, like one of the reasons they've been so reluctant to send F-16s to Ukraine is you have to vacuum the fucking landing strip before you can take off with an F-16. A fucking Russian MiG or whatever, SU-34, 35, whatever they're flying now, they have little hood covers. You can take those fucking things off on a football field covered with grass, okay? An F-16, you literally have to vacuum the perfectly manicured landing strip or takeoff strip, right? Like, our shit is not practical. It's just like if you've ever shot an F-16 and shot an AK-47, there's a reason every guerrilla group in the world has used AK-47s for the last 70 years. It's because they fucking work. That You get them jammed and muddy, clean them out, they work. M-16, great gun, but it's a precious little baby, and oh, the humidity's a little off, and oh, you know, people don't fucking count on M-16s with their lives if they have a choice. And that's when we knew how to do shit. And now we've got this like overstretched, outdated military that's focused on things like the F-35, which is this, you know, multi-trillion dollar disaster that can't fucking fly if it's raining, that the stealth technology basically works twice and then you have to go back and repaint the whole thing over again. What the thing is designed to do is maximize payments to military contractors, not fight and win wars. And what we've seen in Ukraine is that fixed where fixed wing aircraft is so vulnerable to cheap fucking drones and Russian air defense systems. I mean, that's been Russian doctrine forever is to focus on air defense. They were like, okay, the Americans are going to have better jets than us. What are we going to do about it? They focused on missiles and air defense from way back and have continued to update it. I mean, they had a 20 year gap in, in, you know, when the country was basically supine, but, you know, around 2010 or 2012, shortly after Bush and Cheney ripped up all the anti-ballistic missile treaties we had with Russia. And they were like, huh, why are these guys doing that? Because remember throughout this whole period, Yeltsin had been our lapdog and Putin wanted a seat at the table. Putin's whole deal was he basically just wanted to play Russia at the table and Russia is not going to be one of your patsies that gets jacked. You know, y'all can go jack Bolivia or, you know, Peru or Cuba or Thailand or whatever, but we're Russia. We're gonna get our cut, you know, like, and, and 
we just had this succession of politicians who overrode these things. And, you know, like you and I, John, we worked together because we were so horrified at, at that's how we met was GW Bush and Dick Cheney yeah. were such nightmarish disasters. And yet the intellectual heirs of Bush and Cheney, at least Cheney, Bush didn't have any intellectual heir in GW Bush. Sorry, <laughs> obviously that's a <laughs> ridiculous statement. But, you know, Victoria, Victoria Newland, who just resigned a few months ago as the number three person in the State Department, she was Dick Cheney's direct report during the Iraq invasion, right? These people like Madeleine Albright and Victoria Newland and Hillary Clinton and and Dick Cheney and, and, and um, John Bolton, the neocons, the Kagans, they're in both parties. They're a tight clique of elites who've controlled our foreign policy apparatus throughout this period. You know, Bush, I mean, Biden voted for all the Iraq war stuff. Biden was a leading author of the Patriot Act. I mean, Biden is one of the architects of how we got here. And so anybody who thought, oh, we're going to elect Biden, oh, he was cool. He was Obama's old guy friend, right? And think that we're going to get something different than we got with Bush and Cheney. I mean, that was pretty, it was pretty obvious that Biden is not, you know, <clears throat> going to have a radical change from the neocon policies that have gotten us in all these wars over the years. And, you know, it's like, yeah. Well, he's Bush, been compared to FDR, though. I mean, I mean people by are saying, people oh, Biden with has. An, an, I mean, with, by people who have an investment in his success. I mean, it's like people like Paul yeah. Krugman who go around. I'm an economist. And I mean, talk like you might as well say I'm a phrenologist. I'm a leading astrologer. Like economists don't do fuck all that's accurate or real. And we've gamed our economic <laughs> statistics so much <clears throat> that they can go out there and oh, the, the CPI shows there's inflation's actually pretty historically low. Go to the fucking grocery store and tell me that. Like, like go to a restaurant. It's like dishes yeah, I used to yeah. order regularly. I cannot afford anymore, not even once a year. You know, I mean, like it's you can never win a political debate by trying to tell people, oh, your tummy's actually fuller than you think it is. Oh, no, no, no. The lights and the heat aren't going off in your house. It's actually warm and toasty. Look at this chart. That's the kind of pinheaded idiot bullshit, you know, that uh, academics are always trying to do because, you know, we get in these cloudy, you know, cloud castles and convince ourselves of all kinds of nonsense. And the regular person just cuts the Gordian knot and cuts through the bullshit and been like, fuck you, cereal boxes are this wide, Jack. You know, when I was a kid, Captain Crunch came this big, you know, like, and 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 now you're seeing, you remember four years ago when Biden made that disgusting comment? If you're not voting for me, you're not really black. I mean, take the word yeah. out of your mouth, you racist asshole. And, and now you see the numbers. Black people and Latinos led the way, but black people are fleeing the Democrats at an alarming rate and 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 so you know, so well let me ask you what do you think so what do you think is going to happen now with biden is he do you think that he's going to soldier I mean, on and be I the candidate or are they going to i can't parse this stuff but the fact that you you had a sitting congressman like lloyd doggett come out and call for him to step down at least as the yeah. candidate um I mean, people can't unsee what they saw at that debate. I mean, for me, I couldn't unsee the time his dentures fell out of the debate in 2000 or the time that he had a mini stroke and his eyeball turned bloody on stage in 2000. But the media kept that stuff. You didn't see that shit twice, right? Unless you were you yeah, know, on yeah. Twitter or in some kind of Republican meme group or whatever. Like, But I was watching at the time and that freaked me out. And so... Well, everybody was wondering what was wrong with him the other night, and they're saying like, "Well, he's, he's got a cold senile. or whatever." But to I mean, me, it looks like it looks like a TIA. You know, yeah. it looks like maybe a transient ischemic episode. Yeah, he's he's. I mean, you know, I'm not an expert on various types of dementia, but we've all dealt with seniors in our families and seen the symptoms. And dude, shit, I'm used one. To be. And I'm another. <laughs> I'm getting closer every day. And, yeah. and You know, my memory's <clears throat> way worse than it used to be, and, and you know. What's interesting to me, though, is this this whole trend of it's not just Biden. I mean, look at Dianne Feinstein. They were they were rolling her out and insisting that she was lucid and coherent years after it was obvious she wasn't. And then she died and they all. Basically well, and on the other yes, side, Trump. Now. Well, Trump, but Trump's Trump is compared to, say, Strom Thurmond. Remember Strom Thurmond? Hmm. I mean, oh, that yeah, old fossil yeah, yeah. was in the Senate till he was like 100, you know, so but 
I think Trump no. pretty clearly showed like um, there's a blogger named Eve Smith. I followed a, a site called Naked Capitalism. And uh, actually, it was Lambert Strather at that same site who did this analysis. And he's somebody who's put himself through the torture of watching literally hundreds of Trump rallies and and keeping notes on what he says and his speaking patterns and his thoughts and what issues is he using and what, what issues is he tying together and how is he doing his segues and things like that. And he um, did an analysis of Trump's recent speeches. And he was like, you know, I do think he's lost a little bit of his game, but he's still capable of announcing a point clearly and riffing off that point and then segueing to a variation on that point and riffing on that and then segueing to another variation of that point and riffing on that, going to a fourth variation, riffing on that and then tying it back together and then saying a new point thesis sentence and repeating that he can keep up an extended line of thought for 15 to 20 minutes at a time and he can you know and he can still do his thing where he listens to the crowd and if they like it he plays it up if they don't like it he plays it down except for the libertarian party where he basically told him fuck off which is pretty entertaining well you know he um, he also has a yeah. problem sometimes uh, uh there's the notorious uh, uh electrocuting uh somebody on the boat and uh, whether they want to stay and be electric, oh, the shark. The electric boat yeah. or jump in with the sharks and that was with one of the strangest oh yeah I dialogues mean, i've he's, seen he's, in a long he's time he's still a, a weird ass idiot and he's also quite old well, it, it, not what he was a few years ago but he's his dimension is nothing compared to biden i think that was pretty obvious from the debate i mean just look at the numbers i mean i saw one poll where 50 poor percent thought Trump won, six percent thought Biden won. I've never, I've never, you usually you get the same spread of people thinking my guy won. Like you very rarely see people who are Democrats say my guy lost, right? Or, or vice versa. Yeah. Like these debates, the polling, I mean, I've been watching debates as a fan or an amateur or whatever since 88 or really 80, 84. And, and, and as a professional since 92, and you almost never see people make these wild, you know, they go in thinking their guy's going to win. They come out thinking their guy won. That's that's so what we, you normally see. And it's yeah. usually in single digits. I've never seen a 30 point spread between who are you rooting for? Who do you think is going to win and who won? I've never it, seen that. This was a historically atrocious debate performance. Should know? we even be paying yeah. attention to polls? I mean, I see polls about you know from different sources and i mean that's radically that's, different that's 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 a very good point and you know no um but the thing about polls is it's like they're bad and getting worse but they're also frequently the only information we have and they do sometimes tell you things and if you really need a poll to tell you who won that debate i'm sorry you've got issues <laughs> like like i mean that was a historic indefensible bad debate performance because the man is undeniably senile i mean and that raises all kinds of questions like should this man have the ability to push the trigger and annihilate all life on the planet when he doesn't even fucking know what day it is when his strongest supporters say oh he's sharp as attack from 10 a.m to 4 p.m i mean you know the Houthis are not going to pull their wildest stunt of all time. North Korea is not coming out of the woodwork and pull some wild, crazy ass bullshit in those hours, especially now that you've told everybody, right? Mm. Like, I think everybody set their clocks to when is Biden at his best, right? And they know, you know, like, um, and, you know, a friend of mine that, that I respect a lot uh, uh, for his political analysis, he's one of these guys that to me can kind of see around corners. You know, he's just ahead of me on putting together the implications and thought he was real worried that if Biden showed himself to be what we were afraid he was at the debate, which he did, that somebody like Hezbollah or the Houthis are just going to go ape shit and pull some heinous attack. You know, that there's going to be some missile attack or whatever. But to me, it's like if you look at the actual tit for tat dynamics um, and, you know, and it was a lot more debatable when it was when it was only happening between Russia and Ukraine. But I think it's pretty clear now with Israel and the, the different parties they've been, you know, obviously Hamas October 7th was unprecedented for what they had done in the past, but it's not like the history started on October 7th and they're an occupied people and there's yeah. all kinds of, you know, laws, blah, blah, blah. 
the, the, the number of Palestinians that have been killed already in 2023 was very high. The number of pretty outrageous provocations they'd committed in 2023. I mean, things like, you know, storming the, the Temple Mount during a Muslim holy day and things like that. I mean, the, the, the number of atrocities and, and provocations in the West Bank, et cetera, et cetera. And now what we've seen, you know, once Biden gave him the green light, it's full on genocide, you know, and, and mad dog shit and, and things like blowing up the, the embassy, the Iranian embassy compound in Syria. And then you look at Iran's response. Iran's supposed to be the out of control, dangerous, crazy, religious fanatics, uh, you know, terrorist power. Well, they did a three week elaborate negotiation with us about how they were going to respond. And we all agreed, OK, we're not going to kill any civilians. We're going to give you 24, 40, 36 hours warning, you know, um, we're going to do th th this kind of response and it's coming and oh, here it's coming and you've got five hours after the drones start and then it's this, you know, and we had all this time to get all this Air Force support for Israel to, sh to shoot down the drones and all well and good. And we were able to say, look, we shot down 99% of the drones and the missiles and, and the cruise missiles. Well, the thing is, those drones are designed to be shot down. And whenever you shoot down a whole wave of cheap drones, you reveal to your opponent all your missile defense sites, you know, your timing, what kind of missiles you're firing. Um, and, and the main thing is the Iranians spent very little money on that and could repeat it again the next day. Israel and the U.S. and the U.K. and Jordan and Saudi Arabia spent anywhere from two to four billion dollars on that. And could maybe repeat it three or four more times. And the missiles that did get through, they did things like they hit a fucking swimming pool at the officers club of one of Israel's most elite secret um, military sites, right? They're not even supposed to know where this place is. And they hit the swimming pool in the officers mess. No, we didn't kill anybody, but we could have. We could have killed everybody. And you couldn't do jack shit to stop us because the barbaric, you know, primitive other side all have hypersonic missiles. The United States has been trying to develop hypersonic missiles for the last 16 years. For a long time, the military defense versions of Paul Krugman were saying, these hypersonic missiles the Russians claim they have aren't even physically possible. Stupid Russians. Ha, ha, ha. Now, I'm, I'm sure like, Boeing has got to uh, build us. A bang up job. Exactly. And day one of the Ukraine invasion, they showed off one of their hypersonic missiles. And oh, it turns out it works, you know. And and anyway, so my uh, the point of this was my friend was worried that the other side was going to attack. And the side I'm afraid of doing crazy shit is us, you know. I mean, that's the thing to me. It's like once I realized the same evil idiots that have been running the business world since I've been involved in it, you know, which has just gotten worse and worse to the point where now Boeing can't even make functional planes. I mean, the ethos in American court and in international Western corporate world is to drain is to strip mine assets out of any company you have like Jack Welch. Remember Jack Welch from GE, the greatest CEO in history who left that company in rubble. He took over a company that built things, that was a scientific leader, that employed thousands of people, yeah. that was a key part of our military industrial complex. He brought in an ethos of laying people off as a good thing, of, of financializing the company and focusing on, on spreadsheet quarterly results, short-term results, manipulate the numbers as much as you can so you can tell a great story to Wall Street, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> ends up where the 2008 financial crisis nearly killed GE. And then you're like, wait a minute, since when is GE a bank? Well, since Jack Wells took it over, uh, you know, you, you, you realize, okay, these are the kind of people that's in charge of our corporate company, uh, corporate capitalism. And you realize these guys have an oligarchy and they buy and sell politicians, right? That they're, they're in charge over the politicians now and have been ever since, you know, 74, when they ruled that money was speech. And it's just gotten worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and continues to get worse and worse with the Supreme Court decisions we saw the other day. And then you take the history of our uh, foreign policy and, and you, you know, things like the, the coup we backed in Indonesia in 1966. If you haven't seen the documentaries, um, The Act of Killing and The Look of Silence, I, I highly recommend them, although they're terrifying and stomach churning and they detail some of the specifics of 
the genocidal coup we backed, the U.S. government backed in Indonesia in 1965-66, in which over a million people died, <sighs> frequently strangled by hand, okay? And, and mm -hmm. um, you know, or you look at the 1973 coup in Chile, or the 2019 coup in Bolivia, or the fucking farcical, you know, at, at, we're, we're a country that could once pull off a coup like Chile 1973, where one day you've got a semi-popular, semi-controversial socialist president in, in office. The next day, they're bombing the presidential palace. Dude is dead. They're rounding up, you know, Chile's greatest folk singer and, and hundreds of or thousands of other people in the biggest soccer stadium and murdering the guy in front of 10,000 people and imposing this dictatorship that lasts for 30 years. And, and then you get to, like, Trump and Bolton's... and. Uh, Oh, that other idiot, Elliot, what's his face that Trump put in charge of South America. Remember when they tried to declare Juan Guaido was the president of Venezuela? Had no popular oh, constituency, no nothing. The British steal their gold reserves. We officially recognize them, which means Venezuela has no embassy in the United States or most of the West. We couldn't even get a fucking couple of trucks across the bridge from, I think it was Colombia, into Venezuela. I mean, it was the most pathetic coup attempt we've clearly backed in many years and then you had you know the coup we backed in bolivia that lasted six months and then there was this farcical coup the other day and i can't you know evo morales the left-wing former president of bolivia and the current left-wing of president of bolivia are actually bitter enemies and so evo is accusing the current president of having rigged up that coup attempt himself as a as a way to support get back popular support behind him i have no idea if the cia signed off on that coup or not well, there's um, the Bay of Pigs. That was one of my favorites. Oh, sure. Yeah, that was a massive That made massive us a lot of friends. Oh, yeah. And we're continuing to basically genocide Cuba with these sanctions on Cuba for the crime of, of not wanting to be run by American gangsters. You know, I mean, it's just it, but, you know, once you realize that's who these people are and they still are those people. And then, you know, like you look at somebody like Rahm Emanuel who was Obama's chief of staff, who went on to be one of the most disgraceful mayors in Chicago history, who was caught in a hideous racist scandal where they covered up the, the murder of a black youth by police. And, and he was, you know, ridiculously corrupt. He like sold the Chicago parking meters to some scumbag company that's continually raising the rates. And, you know, it's exactly like what they've done in England where they privatized the water system to the point where, People are literally getting shit in their water in London, you know, I mean, it, it's just, but Rahm mm. Emanuel to me is the Democratic Party that I know. Like when I worked in the Democratic Party, like I worked for a guy who was challenging Tom DeLay and I basically made my living harassing Tom DeLay. I remember that. It was so corrupt for so many years. And I, you know, this local lawyer wanted to run against him in this district. Everybody said, don't waste your time. It's a waste of time. My dude raised eight hundred thousand dollars. We delay underperformed Bush by multiple points. You know, at the end of the camp, delay quadrupled his campaign spending from what he'd ever spent before. We made it a real race, and as soon as that race is over, and we go to D.C. thinking that hey, we should be the nominee. You know, we we, we did really well last time. We overperformed. How can we work? You know, with with the D Triple C and everything. We get this meeting with Rahm Emanuel, and to this day. He's one of the three scariest people I've been in a room with. And I've been in a room with, you know, ultimate fighting champions, right? Uh, the, 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 you know, like him, the original singer for Cannibal Corpse and, and a former boss of mine are like the three physically scariest people I've ever been in a room with. Rom has this missing finger and he puts it, pokes it in your face. And he told us, I don't believe in prosecuting congressmen for corruption. Hmm. And let us know essentially what, what we found out a few months later was he cut deals with Harry Reid so that they didn't prosecute Tom DeLay. They had Tom DeLay dead to rights. Shit. His former chief of staff yeah. shut down his multi-million dollar lobbying firm and it was reported in the Washington Post he's expected to plead guilty to multiple felonies in two weeks and begin testifying against DeLay. Well, Rahm and Harry Reid made sure that shit didn't happen. So, you know, we tend to get into this parasocial thing with American politics. The way we are supposed to engage with American politics is you watch it on your screens, you know, either your TV screen, if you're old school, 
or your internet screen if you're young blood. Either way, you're pumping your $25 contributions every time you get the feels. And you really believe that Elizabeth Warren and you are just like this, right? You know, me and Barack Obama, man, mm. I've been to be so fun to go to Hamilton with with Barack and Michelle and Jay-Z and Beyonce. You know, love them. They are so down, you know. And no, <laughs> that is not how fucking politics works. These are operators and they're transactional people and they're functioning at a level that we can't comprehend. Like when people try to get into the love lives of presidents and first ladies, like if you're a middle-class person, you have no context in which to understand that. Unless you grew up in some kind of royal family or you're in the Beatles or whatever, then you can kind of understand, oh, when you're a king, you have this whole court around you and you're married to a queen and she's got this whole court around her and these relationships are negotiated with her people and your people and there's millions of dollars and giant political dynasties at stake. This isn't like, you know, mom and pa kettle meet in high school and they're sweethearts and shit. This is a whole different ball game. These people are not your friends. Yeah, and Trump's uh, queen is missing as in, in action for quite some time, and probably we will and, not and can be you in blame the White her? House if he gets it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you blame her? You know, um, but you know, Democrats are all focused on how much they hate Trump, and Trump is so awful, and he's also such a break with the decorum we're used to. And and like one of the things yeah. that upsets me is so many Democrats over the past eight years saying things like, "I just wish I could go to brunch and not worry about politics again." Like. You know, we've been looking away from things like Gaza and Cuba and Venezuela and all the and Iraq and Libya and Syria and this these horrific nightmares that we go around the world just blithely overthrowing governments and disrupting the lives of millions of people, killing millions of people. Um, and as long as as whoever comes on TV to explain it very briefly, if they do mention it, is polite and has a suit and says all the right things. We're fine. And and then you get to the point, like, are y'all familiar with Matt Miller, who's one of the State Department spokesmen right now? He's yeah, like one of the yeah, big three people. Yeah. They call him Smirkula, right? Because he looks like Dracula and he's always mm -hmm. smirking. Well, Matt and I, mm -hmm. 25 years ago, were the two youngest directors at Public Strategies Incorporated. I know Matt. Matt is fun to yeah. hang out with. Matt is smart as shit. We're both from the Texas Panhandle. He uh, started out as like he would be a spokesman for Southwestern Bell. Then he'd be the spokesman for a congressman. Then he'd go back to the corporate firm and work for the phone company again. Then it'd be another congressman. He worked for Bob Menendez for eight years, right? I think it was during that time it was the last time I talked to Matt. And Matt's one of these people like when you work at a place like Public Strategies, um, which no longer exists. There's other companies called Public Strategies. They ended up being bought by Hill and Knowlton and, and no one yeah. the thing as such. But when you work for a firm like that, one day you might walk in and be like, hey, we're going to pitch Chevron because they want to help the Nigerian government lobby to get this new kind of attack helicopters they can use against protesters who, who don't want oil fields built in their native lands. That one to PSI's credit, they actually turned down. But one of the guys at PSI brought that in as a real thing, you know, but you're dealing with shit like that. Oh, we're working for this horrible company doing this horrible thing and they got caught. And now they need help. Right. So when you're working someplace like that, there's two kinds of people. There's the people who never break the mask who, oh, what a great company. I'm so excited to be working for them. They really, you know, they're bringing quality, low, low cost phone service to real Americans. And it's those bad long distance companies that are the problem. And then there's other people that are like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a hoot working for citizens for higher phone bills, isn't it? You know, like, and Matt was one of those guys who could wink and smile and was in on the joke. And so to watch him now in this position where every day, or at least sometimes people wake him up when he gets in his car, in Virginia to drive into DC or maybe he lives in Maryland where when he gets out of his suburban house and goes to his nice car in the morning, there are people out there chanting genocide, genocide, you know, and he's got, well, why don't you ask Hamas about that? You know, and then he goes to work and they ask him things. Well, what about this instance where the IDF, you know, blew up a six year old girl in an ambulance? The IDF is investigating and I can't comment, you know, like just saying the most outrageously horrific, you know, uh, I mean, it's it's Goebbels level disinformation and, and, and evil that he's spewing, you know, and and even if Trump would want his stated purpose is to do even faster, better, bigger genocide uh, for Israel. 
Um, at the point you're arguing like which Nazi general is going to do the genocide worse, I think you're pretty lost, <laughs> right? And that's where I think we're at, where the chickens are coming home to roost. It was one thing to commit a genocide in Yemen, which we funded and backed from 2015 on uh, until until Saudi Arabia and Iran cut a peace deal last year, brokered by China. Did y'all follow that? Because it hardly got any coverage in the U.S. media, but it was a geopolitical earthquake. Saudi Arabia and Iran cut a peace deal brokered by China. And our dumb ass wow. is so backwards that when Yemen started shooting at ships in the Red Sea, our first announced plan was, you know, State Department spokespeople say that uh, Saudi Arabia, they're working with Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia is going to invade Yemen again and teach those punks a lesson. Well, Saudi Arabia got their ass kicked by Yemen for eight years and doesn't want any more of that, right? The Yemenis are crazy fuckers who live in the mountains that we've, who've been bombed by F-16s and F-22s and even some F-35s and all the missiles we could sell Saudi Arabia, you know, from 2015 to 2022. There ain't jack shit we can do to the Yemenis as we've seen. I mean, remember that meme when, when the, the kerfuffle in the Red Sea started and it was like, Yemen's about to learn why well, we don't have health care. And it shows all these, you know, destroyers and aircraft carriers barreling down on Yemen. And what, what did we end up doing? Well, we've bombed them about 40 times. Well, Yemen has been bombed a lot more than that over the last eight years. And they've got all their shit hardened and underground and it's cheap and it's movable. And we don't actually know where the missiles are. And basically, we can't do anything to Yemen. We could... You know, like people think we have this infinite capacity militarily, and we don't. I mean, we have yeah. the lowest reserves we've had in decades, I think since 73 or something. There's like 47,000 people in the reserve. And, and partly it's because we've been strip mining military reservists for the last 25 years. If you know anybody who's in the military reserve, well, you know, they probably went to Iraq for a couple of years. They might have gone to Afghanistan. They got the fuck out of that. Like it used to be, oh, I'm in the Army Reserve. I go to camp once a year, party with my friends. You know, it's a good way to work a few weekends, you know, one weekend a month. It's a great way to earn some extra money and keep my hand in the military or whatever. After a decade of uh, multiple decades of if you do that, you're going to end up serving years, serving years in some horrible place like Iraq. Not that Iraq's a horrible place, but after what we did to it, it was. And if you're an American there, that's an occupying power. It's yeah. a pretty horrible place to be. And Afghanistan, sorry, is a horrible place. <laughs> and and um, you know the the wars that the Soviet Union and the United States have inflicted on it over the last fifty years obviously contributed enormously. But Afghanistan's known as the graveyard of empires for a reason. It's so high altitude and filled with these warring tribes and all this shit. I mean. You know, we have no business sending troops to Afghanistan, and now we don't have the troops to do it anymore. We can't invade Yemen. Mm. Where, where are we, you know, and if you look at polling again with polls, but it's the only data we've got, Generation Z does not want to join the army, you know, and they're talking about drafts and this and that. And it's just like Europe, you know, where France is going to institute a draft and Germany's talking about a draft and we're going to spend 3% of our GDP on military and blah, blah, blah. And None of that is happening. And those European governments that have backed Biden and the Ukraine are some of the least popular governments in European history. What we're watching in France right now is Macron basically <laughs> handing over governorship to the fascists, um, which is a classic dynamic that happens over and over again, where you have these centrist governments that impose austerity and favor the wealthy and screw the working class and then just quietly you know, people get fed up with it and start vote, voting for real honest to God Nazis or, you know, the next best thing. And I mean, it's a I real guess you might as well get the real the real thing in there. Hey, I mean, we yeah. uh, we have reached the end of our hour. Can you believe it? <laughs> Thanks. For and you've around. got me ready to move to Mars. I'm going to I'm going to contact <laughs> Elon and see if I can get on. I'm, I wouldn't get on I'm going Elon to rent track. space in one of those uh bunkers people have been installing <laughs> yeah i need a bunker uh, yeah, yeah. The, the the bunkers well you know the so thank, bunkers thanks the man this sure, is great sure. well uh, happy to happy to chat uh, sorry to yeah thanks yeah so let's do it again soon up. i sure, i mean you back. You know. there's plenty to talk about <laughs> no end yeah i missed you it's man it's been a long time likewise, likewise. a long time
All right. Well, good talking. Thanks for having me. Adios. Okay. Bye. Thanks a lot. We'll talk to you soon. Adios. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.